Dr. Jeffrey Crawford is a Duke Cancer Institute oncologist specializing in lung cancer. He is a professor of medicine and the George Barth Geller Distinguished Professor of Immunology. He, um, his practice focuses on new treatment approaches for lung cancer, clinical trials, and targeted de drug development, as well as supportive care for cancer patients. He has been the lead investigator of randomized trials that ultimately led to FDA drug approval. Dr. Crawford has been my oncologist since uh, 2013. Um, um, he's never treated me, actually. He's only given me my annual CT scan, So, but I probably see him more at conferences than I do in his office, which is good. good. Um, I saw Dr. Crawford last month for my annual scan, and um, I had asked him previously if he would be our speaker for uh, this meeting, and he said yes, and he asked me uh, what I wanted him to speak about, and I said, you know, I would love for you to talk about the science of hope. I also asked him how long he's been in this lung cancer space, and he said about 40 years. I have seen incredible changes um, in the past 15 years. So imagine how much Dr. Crawford has seen in four decades. And frankly, in my opinion, our hope 15 years ago was based more on wishful thinking and um, than anything else. But as Dr. Crawford will share today, based on scientific advancements, today we have more reason to hope than ever before. So thank you, Dr. Crawford, for speaking with us today. Thank you so much. Uh... And uh, D Dusty and Lynn, thank you for inviting me to do this and all your uh, work with Live Lung and supportive advocacy for our, our survivors here. And uh, glad to see so many people on the, on the call. So feel free to interrupt me at any point. Um, it was actually Dusty who gave me the, the uh, title, Science of Hope. I thought that was really, really good. I like to claim credit for it, but it really is her idea. And I would say, um, I probably had been doing this 40 years, but, but in terms of my role at Duke, it started about 30 years ago. I started, I was actually at the VA hospital uh, prior to that um, and working in lung cancer and other types of cancer, but really came uh, in 1990 across the street, as we say, to Duke and um, started to build a lung cancer program. And I guess my hope <clears throat> was that we would uh, over time uh, expand the, the lifespan and the quality of life for patients with, uh, with lung cancer and make a survivorship a bigger and bigger issue. Um, and uh, ultimately to see more people cured of lung cancer, which is our ultimate goal. Um, and I think we, we're doing that. Um, I think I've had hope all along, uh, but I think most of the progress really has happened uh, in the last decade and really in the last few years. It's just, it's just remarkable to see what's happened. So I think um, it's really science that's driven the hope we now have for lung cancer. So that's really what we'll talk about. Um, and again, pl please feel free to interrupt me with any, any questions at any point. Uh, so I would like to make this very interactive. So if we can go to the next slide, Lynn, that'd be great. Um, so I'm starting with imaging, just x-rays, because uh, that, there's been a lot of advance uh, in what's happened there. Uh, very importantly, uh, chest CT, which I think you all are familiar with. Uh, we've been using it diagnostically for a long time. Um, it's taken out a bigger role in early detection. So now uh, people without uh, lung cancer that may be at risk uh, based on smoking or other characteristics uh, can get a chest CT, and we know that application of those CT scans uh, in the right population can lead to earlier detection uh, at an earlier stage and a greater likelihood patients can have surgery uh, and a greater chance that they will ultimately be cured of the cancer. We still have a, a long way to go to implement screening as, as widely as we'd like, but um, it's, uh, it's been a big advance over the last five years in particular. And then maybe going back a little bit further, uh, do most of you know what PET scans are? Is that, you can wave your hands or, or no, okay. So, uh, so PET imaging came along. So the CT imaging tells us a little bit about whether there's a tumor in the lung or other parts of the body, um, but it's not as sensitive as, as it could be. Um, and PET imaging provides us an additional test that helps us very much in determining whether a spot in the lung or liver or other place is likely to be cancer or not. 
because it's based on glucose uptake, uh, sugar uptake, uh, that's done through an intravenous uh, administration. And when we do that, we can see areas light up. And when they light up, that's not diagnostic, but very suspicious for possible um, cancer being present. Uh, so it helps, to, helps us take what might just be a scar tissue and tell whether it is cancer or the reverse. We may see a spot in the lung that turns out to be scar tissue and not really related to cancer. It's very helpful initially just to sort out patients that may or may not be candidates for surgery, but now we routinely use it and diagnostically across all patients with, with lung cancer. So it really gives us a better idea. And because of that, we're better able to classify the stage of the cancer, whether it's localized or advanced. Um, the other technique, of course, is brain MRI. So we can make sure if there are small areas in the brain that are involved, we now know that uh, much to much better extent by MRI. So these techniques have been around for 10, 15 years or more, but I think they've refined the classification. So that last thing down there, it says IASLC, that's International Lung Cancer Group. And based on this kind of imaging, as well as surgery and other things, they've been able to refine our classification of staging. And that gives us a much better idea stage by stage of what the outlook is for patients and then try to figure out how we can advance that, whether it's with surgery, with radiation, with chemotherapy, or as we'll hear, with immunotherapy and targeted therapy. So um, these are all very important building blocks to help us figure out how to, how to move forward with, uh, with management of patients. Uh, next slide. So I'd say with, with these improvements, uh, we're better able to identify patients for these different techniques as I've just mentioned. Are there any, any questions on this slide, anybody? Is everybody with me more or less? Okay, <laughs> okay, good. All right, so the next slide. Um, so the second part of this, we have to have imaging, but then we have to have pathology. And this has been a huge advance in the, in the last decade or so. So it's, it started initially decades ago when you have a lung cancer, it was, we found that there were different subtypes and one type was called small cell cancer. I'm not gonna talk much about that today, but I'm happy to address questions. And then we had non-small cell, meaning not small cell. And that was the only separation really for decades. Uh, and that was really born because one, we could tell small cell pretty easily under the microscope um, and two, we learned early on that, that small cell was very sensitive to chemotherapy treatment and non-small cell really wasn't. It wasn't very sensitive at all in the early days. So that was the separation. It was also clear that uh, small cell patients, unfortunately, by the time we diagnosed it was in a more advanced stage, they rarely were able to get surgery. And that remains true even today. But that was really for a long time, the only separations we made uh, between how we approach things. And, and in fact, we treated all non-small cell patients uh, the same after the stage, they all got the same type of treatments. But then we began to realize that different subtypes of non-small cell have different outcomes. So adenocarcinoma, the most common type uh, of, of lung cancer and particularly in non-smokers, but uh, in smokers as well, and particularly in women uh, is different than squamous cancer. So and we have different treatments now for them. Um, and we also know, particularly when we separated those out, that um, they were different if you looked at them molecularly, meaning if you looked at the genetics that's driving the cancer, um, the, uh, the squamous cancer looks very different, not only under the microscope, but when you do this genetic profile, it looks very different than adenocarcinoma. And the adenocarcinoma is where we really began to unravel different uh, molecular drivers. These are genetic changes in the tumor that are actually driving the cancer to grow and divide. And that's where we've made advances in medicines we call targeted therapy. And I'll come back to that later. Uh, but these targeted therapies are very different than chemo. They're very selective. They attack a specific uh, gene in the tumor and have been uh, quite successful. We'll, we'll talk more about it, but without understanding the molecular basis, without understanding the real pathology of what's going on, the biology, uh, we wouldn't be where we are today. 
so that that was a huge advance then that continues now we're still uh, sorting out and identifying new markers that may have more specific treatments than chemotherapy does and then of course the third the third area and this is still very uh, uh rapidly evolving this is immunotherapy and you've maybe some have, have received but you've certainly heard of uh, immune checkpoint treatments and the, the they're better known by their brand names. Keytruda, Opdivo are the ones that are very commonly seen on television, which have had a huge impact on at least a segment of, of patients. Um, and we're still kind of sorting out from the pathology standpoint, what's the best marker that tells us who's gonna benefit from those treatments and who's not. So we have some tests uh, that we can do, but we don't have anything quite as uh, specific as these molecular markers. We have something called PDL1 that tells us something about the uh, likelihood that cancer might respond, but we don't we don't know nearly enough. And I'll, I'll come back and talk more about immunotherapy later. But again, it, without the pathologist and biologists really helping us through this, we wouldn't have the therapies we have today. So next point here. So this is basically saying that we're beginning to understand. I haven't used the word heterogeneity, but that's important. That just means variation. So we know if you look at a tumor, that all the cells are actually different in a tumor. They're not all the same. Some have a little different genetic makeup than others. Some might be sensitive to chemotherapy. Some cells might be sensitive to immunotherapy, some to targeted therapy. So um, we really need to understand all this at a molecular level better so we know really how to attack the cancer um, and, uh, and hopefully eradicate it. So this is all about personalized treatment, trying to not just treat all patients the same, but go past just the stage of the cancer and the, um, the pathology of the cancer, but really at a molecular level, what's driving it and how do we best uh, design treatment just for the, the individual patient. Okay, questions on this? No, okay, but feel free, any, there's, any questions are fine if I'm, well, I just have a quick question. Too, too high. Let me know. Um, Dr. Crawford, um, yeah. could you just um, maybe explain the difference between PDL and PDL1? Yeah, okay. So, uh, so, um, so PDL, PDL stands for programmed death ligand. I guess that doesn't make any simpler. Does it? But what, that, what that's telling, so PDL, uh, and that this, th these are receptors, PDL receptor are present on white blood cells, particularly what we call lymphocytes. And those are part of our immune system. And those, the PDL ligand is like a protein that can bind to that receptor. When it does that, it kills the lymphocytes. So, uh, and that's a normal checkpoint in our bodies that helps regulate our immune system so it doesn't get overly rambunctious, doesn't get too active. So that's normally present. Um, so what happens in cancer is the cancer cells have figured out how to make that ligand, that protein. So there, the tumor cells are able to actually uh, destroy the immune cells around them because they're able to kind of fire these ligands, these bullets at the white blood cells and destroy them. <clears throat> so I don't, does that make sense? Um, oh, one second. So um, PDL1 is one type of the ligand. There's also something called PDL2. So they're, they're, they're related, but basically it's pretty remarkable. And I might as well say this now since we're on it. Um, <clears throat> so if, if you think about chemotherapy or radiation treatment, they work by directly destroying the cancer cell. That's, that's, that's what they do. Whereas with these immune drugs we're now seeing on television and patients are getting and benefiting from, What's happening is there, these are antibodies that go in and block, block this PDL from happening. So it keeps the immune cells from being destroyed. So it's like it puts up a shield to protect the white blood cells from being destroyed by the cancer. And then in turn, those white blood cells kind of rise up and attack and destroy the cancer. So it's sort of a very Star Wars like thing, but it's, it really happens and it's pretty impressive. Anyway, does that, does that, is yes, that sort of clear? 
it's, it's complicated. I have trouble you know, explaining this to my residents too, but hopefully, I think you, I think you all got that more or less. So it's, it's a very different and very important discovery that really is moving things forward. So let's go to the next slide. So, um, so let's, let's start with advanced stage lung cancer. We're gonna work our way earlier in the course. So what's been standard for lung cancer treatment for decades, all the decades I've been doing this, uh, is chemotherapy. Um, and so chemotherapy, as I was saying, there are lots of different types of chemotherapy, but these are medicines generally through the vein. There are some oral medicines, but most of these have to be in lung cancer administered by IV. Um, and they, um, they attack the cancer cells directly, which is a good thing, but they also unfortunately attack normal cells because they're, they're working based on DNA and RNA and the normal uh, mechanics of normal cells as well as cancer cells. So they tend to affect rapidly growing cells, whether they're cancer cells or not. And thus the, the side effects, unfortunately, we see in terms of hair loss and nausea and diarrhea and sore, sores in the mouth and you know, multiple things that uh, those that have been through chemotherapy, unfortunately, know all too well. But these treatments, we have made strides, uh, I'd say, over time. One, by better uh, chemotherapy with less side effects. It's a little bit more tailored, if you will. And then uh, very important, and uh, what a lot of my work was in back uh, in the 90s, was around supportive care and palliative care, trying to make these agents safer. And the biggest side effect of chemotherapy uh, is its effect on white blood cells. So if, if you don't have enough healthy white blood cells in your body and you take chemotherapy, you're at risk of developing infection and that can be life-threatening. So uh, we worked a lot with the development of medicines that, that help the white blood cells come back faster after chemotherapy. Uh, and so that's become a standard treatment for patients that are, that are taking uh, several types of chemotherapy. Um, so I, and I can't stress too, too much that, and I probably should have had a separate slide just on supportive and palliative care, but, but clearly none of this happens in and of itself, whether you're talking about surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, or anything else I'm going to talk about, hand in hand with the treatment um, of patients going through this is supportive and palliative care. And th those are kind of overlapping terms. Supportive care is usually referred to uh, in terms of medicines or other approaches to help reduce the side effects of treatment. Palliative care are treatments meant, meant to um, help patients get through pain and other complications of cancer. And they're really kind of integrated well together. Uh, and I think we've learned in particular that uh, having expertise in palliative care is very important, and particularly for patients with advanced lung cancer, because um, they have so much going on in terms of their, um, their life, uh, their family, their illness, their treatments, and so, uh, not all that gets covered well, frankly, in an oncology visit. And so having a separate palliative care specialist is really important. Um, and unfortunately, there are not enough of them. So they're not enough available in the community or even in the academic centers. But where we can integrate palliative care with other standard treatments for advanced cancer, we know that uh, patients do better. Uh, uh, their quality of life is better. Uh, they spend less time in the hospital. Um, and they live longer. So it's, it's a really important endpoint, something that, uh, again, be happy to talk further about. Um, next slide. So <laughs> my bottom line is we need to make chemotherapy, keep ma making it better. There are some interesting developments where we have antibodies that attack a certain surface protein on cancer cells, and we connect it to a little bit of chemotherapy. So it's sort of smart chemotherapy. So that's that's one direction, but I think there are other things that will um, make chemotherapy safer for, uh, for people that need to take it uh, in the future. Okay, any, any other questions on the chemo slide? We'll go to the next slide. So targeted therapy, you already heard that term. So that's a distinct term meant to be used when we have a treatment for cancer 
where we're really attacking a certain mutation or alteration in a certain gene inside the cancer that we think is driving the cancer. So we have this term driver mutations. You can think of that like a gas pedal. This is something that's gone haywire in the, uh, in the cancer cell, a normal gene that would normally be helping regulate how cells grow and divide, but it's gotten turned on in the on position the whole time um, and uh, is driving the cancer. And we've developed uh, drugs that specifically block that uh, driver mutation. So the best example of this, um, and you, you may, or may not have heard of this, is in lung cancer, uh, something called EGFR, epidermal growth factor receptor. That's a normal um, gene that, that's in all our cells, particularly our cells in the skin and uh, other parts of the body that help regulate how our cells grow and divide. But in this case, something's gone wrong. There's some alteration in the gene um, that makes it always in an on position and with no, nothing to shut it off. So drugs have been developed over the last 10 years that, that particularly block that. Um, have you ever heard of Arisa or Tarsiva and now currently Tigriso? These are all different generations of drugs, but um, particularly Tigriso has been very effective in patients whose tumors express that particular um, genetic change. The likelihood of benefit is 80, 90%. And for most patients, they respond for years, not months. And so that's, that was a big change from chemo. And those people were taking chemo because we didn't know they had this driver and we didn't know how to test for it. Uh, they got the same benefit anyone else with chemo, but no more. But now that we know that they have a driver mutation, they can get um, a lot more benefit from, from chemotherapy, from the targeted therapy. So less side effects because it's more specific targeting that particular gene um, and much more uh, durable. We're still trying to find a way for this to be a cure. Uh, I would say there are some patients that probably have been cured from this, but the majority eventually the tumor figures out a way around it. So we're looking for other drugs that may help block this. But uh, targeted therapy has been a big advance. And so pretty much our standard of care is anybody that presents that has advanced lung cancer, the diagnosis gets testing, gets some molecular testing to tell us, do they have one of these driver mutations that we can can treat with a targeted therapy rather than chemotherapy. Uh, so that's been uh, a dramatic advance in the science of hope. Can I see uh, the next slide? So I guess I just said that, okay. But I, but I think we can still do better. We're, we're, we're on the pathway, but I think, uh, I think we can do better. Uh, and we're seeing what's happening is, you know, we might see for the, this EGFR, which is one of the more common ones, um, it may be 15 or 20 percent of patients. Uh, it's more prevalent in people that haven't smoked, but we see it in people that are, are prior smokers as well. But we're finding others, and there's a something called KRAS, which is a very common um, gene mutation in lung cancer. And there's now, uh, for one of the subtypes, a drug that looks very effective for that. So there's a lot of excitement about that, and that's just it's working its way through some clinical trials. But I, I think the FDA will be looking at that in the next year. So we keep finding new Dr. New, Crawford, new mutation. Well, yes. would you mind, um, we're kind of involved with um, a group, a KRAS kickers group. Would you mind just um, sharing a little bit more about this KRAS drug that you're talking about? Yeah, sure. Okay. So, all right. So um, I don't want to take it too far in the weeds here. So KRAS is a very frequently mutated uh, gene. Um, and one of the more common types is something called KRAS G12C. It's one, so there's different KRAS mutations, but the one that's, uh, that where we found an oral medication that targets it um, has just come up in the last you know, year or two. Uh, there are a couple of different companies that are working on it. Um, Amgen has one that uh, we have studies with. UNC has another one uh, uh, by Marathi. Uh, they both look active, but there was uh, one of the big journals that we all look to, the New England Journal of Medicine, just had a, the initial uh, data from uh, the Amgen drug just a, a couple months ago. 
and what it it's again it's early days for this but um again these were patients where there was nothing but chemotherapy options before and with this drug um the majority 80 90 percent of patients either get the cancer to stop growing or shrink um and many of those patients are at a year or beyond with durable responses not all some have a shorter duration response so, but it's a it's the first time we've been able to crack into that particular mutation and so and that's one of the most common mutations in lung cancer so so we're hoping that will lead to other other uh, similar agents being developed for other kras subtypes um so and it's Thank and you. again sort of like the other drugs it's there's, none of these things are side effect free, but um, there's mild side effects. You don't get severe risk of low white blood count or you know, things like that, but you can have some nausea or diarrhea and things like that. So there are side effects we always have to manage, but, but I think these are easier to deal with from a lifestyle and quality of life uh, standpoint. Uh, and we'll see more and more of this going forward. So uh, any other questions there? So the next slide. All right, so the third piece of this, we talked about chemotherapy, we've talked about targeted therapy. Um, so immunotherapy is obviously what everybody wants now. Everyone that comes in to see me says, so well, I don't wanna take chemo. They don't know much about targeted therapy, but they, they want it if, once they heard about it, but they all know, but everybody knows about immunotherapy. Um, and so uh, this has been a, a remarkable advance. And I, I told you a little bit about that science, about figuring out about immune checkpoints and how they n normally work uh, in the body and how the tumors were smart enough to figure out how to uh, use them to their advantage. And now we're smart enough to figure out how to block that. Um, so uh, I'd say one of the most amazing things to me was when I uh, treated some of our first patients with this, uh, just to look at the CT scans improve, knowing that I was giving a single antibody and immunotherapy um, that wasn't attacking the cancer at all, but boosting the immune system and the immune system was destroying the cancer. Um, and these were, in, uh, when the first studies were done, these were in patients who uh, had really exhausted most of their options. They, they'd been through chemotherapy and um, any treatments we had, had maybe months of benefit at best. Um, and a subpopulation of those patients are now alive five years, um, maybe 20 to 30% of patients who we would have deemed incurable um, are past five years with no active cancer. Um, so it's a pr pretty remarkable advance. Now, the issue of course is it's not everybody. It seems like 20 or 30% of patients when you look at most of these studies get these long-term benefits. Um, and it doesn't come without a price because when you boost the immune system, um, you, sometimes the normal immune cells uh, maybe attack other parts of your body. So skin rash and sometimes colitis or irritation of the colon, thyroiditis, thyroid problems, uh, and really virtually any organ in the body, occasionally pneumonitis, inflammation in the lung. So th these are very powerful agents. We don't really understand fully who's gonna get the long-term benefit, who's gonna get the, what we call immunotoxicity. So it's, it's really early days, but this is really the future of cancer treatment, I think. How to use these by themselves, maybe they should be combined in some people with chemotherapy or targeted therapy, but it's a, it's a very, very exciting area. Um, and it's one that Duke has been very uh, invested in. We've recruited uh, somebody named Dr. Scott Antonia here, who is, um, you know, international leader in this kind of field. So he's gonna help us hopefully figure out how to get that 20 and 30, to 30% group to be 90 to 100% someday, but uh, it's a work in progress. Um, can I just see the next slide? Which you know, <laughs> we, have much, we have much to learn, but questions about this. Um, I don't know if you have friends or others that you know have been through these treatments or any testimonials or anecdotes anybody wants to bring up? Okay, hey, so to... more to see, it's, it, it is interesting to, to, to see. And Somebody think... was about to say something there. Oh, sorry. Please. Is that, Paula, were you gonna say? Yes, I'm very interested in the targeted therapy. 
Okay. Uh, which is what I'm on. I'm on to Gresso. Just oh, congratulations. Year. Thank you. And you said something that hit home, which I've heard before. At some point, that cell, the cancer cell, is going to get smarter than my Tegressa. And I didn't hear you say anything after Tegressa. Yeah, so, therapy. go ahead. Yeah, no, good. So I think, well, it's not, not uh, necessarily that everyone gets, that the cancer always gets smarter. You know, some patients are fortunate that the, that, that was the drug and, and they get a long-term benefit at, uh, for many years and so far. Uh, we have, even with the earlier generation treatments, there's a subgroup of patients I have that are out five, 10 years. So, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't be, you know, the, the, and the longer you go, that's the other thing people think, you know, well, it's, it works for two years on the average. People think, well, when I get close to two years, it's going to stop working. That that's, that's for a population. So for you or for others, the longer you go, the longer you're likely to, to benefit from it. But yeah, so the question is, what, what would happen afterwards? Well, we are testing um, additional drugs to add to it, to add the to, to Grisso. Um, sometimes we can add local treatments if it's just one area or another that need to be treated. Um, and then for others, that, then we are switching over maybe to immunotherapy or chemoimmunotherapy. So those, those are still options, but obviously the longer we can stay with plan A, the better. So congratulations, keep doing well. Paulie, do you have something? You're, you're, you're muted. So did you have anything else to say? I'm thanking you oh. <laughs> for that encouraging news okay, because good, you're good. right. I'm I'm a little over a year and I'm getting anxious that I might yeah. be getting to the end of the, the effectiveness of it. You should be getting less anxious. You should be getting less anxious because you, you, well, thank you because you're doing better. You're doing well so far that you'll continue onward. I appreciate that. Thank sure. you again. Sure. Anything, any, oh, anyone else have any questions about the I just want, stuff? I just wanted to say to everyone, if you do have a question for Dr. Crawford, if you just press your space, space bar on your laptop, oh. if you're on a laptop, then you can, you, you'll be unmuted temporarily. Okay. Good. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, let's, let, let's go to the next slide here. I don't want to take your whole uh, time up here with this. So that's, that, that was all advanced stage. Um, lung cancer. This is what we call stage three, but th th this particular slide is around patients who don't have early stage, like stage one or two, where they normally get surgery. Um, stage three usually means there's been spread to lymph nodes outside the lung, which makes it uh, technically difficult uh, to, to remove all the cancer and, and not, less, not necessarily help because you haven't really gotten rid of everything. So long time ago, radiation became the standard of treatment for that, that stage. Uh, and we've made a lot of advances in radiation over time. You know, I think, you know, radiation, are, these are machines that aim radiation directly at the cancer. In the early days, the machines weren't very sophisticated. We weren't able to do all of the physics and the measurements and stuff that the radiation oncologists can do now. So it's much more precise and now includes things like stereotactic radiation uh, in particular settings where you can just really go in and zap a tumor in the lung. Uh, gamma knife is often the term used for this. Uh, you may have heard that, but um, it's been, been pretty revolutionary and, and we've gotten better at reducing the field. So side effects of radiation are better. So uh, a lot of technical improvements over the last few decades. We also learned a couple decades ago that adding chemotherapy to the radiation actually made that more likely to be successful. So even in the absence of surgery, uh, we were curing maybe 20% of patients with chemotherapy and radiation, uh, which is again, not great, but it was better than, you know, better than zero and, and, a, and, a, and a clear improvement. But we were on a plateau there for you know, really probably 20 years where we tried different chemotherapies, different radiations, nothing really seemed to make a difference. Um, then immunotherapy came along. So the, the drugs I was just talking about have been added after chemotherapy and radiation and have made an incredible difference. So now we don't know because we're not out five years yet, but we think it may be as much as a doubling of long-term survival by adding uh, immunotherapy after chemo and radiation. 
Um, and again, that work was done by Dr. Antonia, the doctor I just mentioned uh, that's come to Duke. So uh, it's pretty, it's really changed the standard of care for what is almost 30% of lung cancer patients uh, in the US and worldwide. So it's, it's pretty impressive. So obviously, uh, next slide. How do we make for, yeah, so that's, that's good for now. What do we do next? Uh, so obviously a lot of work is going on, figuring out different schedules. Uh, this was, this advance was done by adding immunotherapy after chemo and radiation, and studies are now adding at the same time, um, combinations of treatments. So uh, it'll take you know a while to work all this out, but we've already made significant uh, significant progress. So that's uh, that is definitely part of the science of hope. Let's go on to the next slide, unless there's questions. So what about early stage disease? So obviously everyone would like to have surgery and get the cancer out and be done with it, not take any other medicine and, and things be good. But, but we've always had trouble identifying lung cancer early because there's not a lot of warning symptoms. By the time patients have any issues, uh, the cancer is often advanced. So the CT stuff I was talking about is very, very important to just um, do screening for people that might be at risk, uh, detect it early, hopefully remove it at a stage where no further therapy is needed. And those would usually be smaller tumors without any lymph node spread. We've also had a lot of surgical advances. We've seen um, um, improvements with something called VATS, video assisted thoracoscopic surgery. When I first started doing this, the surgeons had to do these big incisions and uh, there was a lot of pain and suffering literally from, from that procedure and a lot of post-operative complications. Now they can go in with these very small uh, tools uh, and make very small incisions, get the cancer out often without any large uh, um, invasion into the chest wall. So patients recover much faster, uh, go home much sooner and have less post-operative pain and complications. So that, that's been important. Now, one of the other things we've noticed um, the, uh, with chemotherapy, um, after surgery. So again, these agents that we haven't really embraced, uh, but have, have, haven't had an alternative for a long time, got used after surgery, after the sur surgeon removed the cancer and the lymph nodes in the cancer, whatever. Um, and with a limited amount of chemotherapy over generally 12 weeks, um, we know that we can cure more patients with chemotherapy, uh, particularly the ones that have lymph, lymph node involvement. But again, we've been on sort of a plateau from that for quite a while. So we've done a lot of different chemotherapy trials and different agents, but at, at the end, the amount of benefit um, was not huge uh, to say the least, but it might, but if you're in that group, if you're in the 10% group that's gonna get cured because of chemotherapy, that's very important. But um, other patients are cured from the surgery, but other patients, despite getting surgery and chemotherapy, unfortunately still have the cancer come back. So the breakthrough there um, is the same drug that uh, Paul is taking. So uh, we figured out that, well, what about these patients that have tumors with EGFR mutations, uh, but have early stage cancer? Will they benefit from Tegrissa the same way the patients with more advanced cancer do? And the answer is yes. Uh, so just this, um, this summer at, the, at our large ASCO meeting, uh, used to be large, <laughs> it's a very small meeting now in terms of attendance, but um, a large trial was presented on patients that had surgery, generally chemotherapy afterwards, uh, and either got to Grisso or didn't, but the group that got to Grisso for a three year period, almost the, the vast majority of them were still responding after three years where patients that didn't get it majority, unfortunately, uh, had recurred. So this drug has not yet been approved for this indication by the FDA yet, but it, uh, it likely will be. And um, most of us are, are, are testing patients with early stage lung cancer to see if that is present to see if they then can be eligible for this. So again, another, just like the immunotherapy was a major advance, um, in stage three in the inoperable patient. This is a huge advance for a subsegment of the population. And we'll have to see over time whether uh, these other targets will have the same benefit early on and 
may be more benefit than chemotherapy, um, but we're hopeful. And of course, the, the last slide here. Um, so what about immunotherapy? So if immunotherapy works so great in stage three, and we talked, we're talking about it even for stage four patients with long-term benefit, will this be something we'll be doing routinely? Um, we're, we're not doing that right now because we don't have the trials to tell us that's beneficial, but most of them have been done already. Um, there are three large trials. We're waiting for results to tell us uh, whether immunotherapy should be part of this treatment or not. Meanwhile, uh, there are a lot of trials ongoing giving immunotherapy prior to surgery with chemotherapy and different combinations. So it's a very active area for, for investigation. But and I think most of us anticipate within hopefully a year or two, we'll have enough information to know how to use these routinely. Um, so we've come a long way. Uh, it's been a long time if you go way back, but if you look re relatively recently, most of what I've talked about are advanced in the last five years. So it's, it's, it's pretty remarkable for, so for survivors of lung cancer, uh, there is clearly hope uh, and there's hope uh, uh, in the immediate future for, for new beneficial treatments that uh, people can go if they need it. But the best thing is for us to obviously control the cancer the first time around and not need anything past that. So let me, I'll just stop there and uh, see if there's any questions or anything I can answer for anybody.